reading this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, starting with the ninth verse. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Zeal here could be translated passion or worship as well. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. May be seated. Our children, uh, we have our verse to read. It's only a couple of kids. Well, we're going to read it anyway. <laughs> It's the question 12 to the catechism. It says, what does God require in the ninth and 10th commandments? Ninth, that we do not lie or deceive. And in the 10th, that we are content, not envying anyone. Amen. Children dismissed. I'm not trying to be antisocial this morning, but uh, I'm not greeting people. I've got a sinus infection, and uh, so I'm going to keep my distance. Uh, I just wrote, read from uh, Romans chapter 12. And I frequently use this verse, these, this chapter, to refer to the, the lifestyle that God wants us to be living and, and uh, the things that he wants us to do. And... What I'm looking at today is kind of summing up what we, we did through uh, celebrating Advent. Now that we understand who God is, what he's done for us, then you know, what is our purpose? What is our responsibility? What is our response to this? And I start with what the Westminster uh, Confession states in reference to purpose of man. A man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Again, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now, this idea of glorifying God is, I mean, I guess I should start it this way. How do we glorify God? Okay, and, and I know I've used these verses often, but I'm going to give a little more uh, depth to them today, I hope. In chapter 12, of uh, the first couple of verses of, of Romans, uh, chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Starts right there. How do we, what do we do? We offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And I'm going to pre uh, say that it comes before that is that we must confess with our heart, uh, mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then we come to that point where we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Meaning, we when you offer God a sacrifice, it's not something that you give Him and then what? Take back. You give Him, and it's a permanent ownership. There was a campus crusade, I think, uh, and and uh, used a, uh, a picture of, of a circle. Of it would, which would be the domain of all things that you are and own and have and do and want to do. And in the, in the center of it is a throne. And most of the time, we have self on the throne and Christ at the, at the foot of the throne or somewhere else in the circle. And what 
the goal is, this idea of offering ourselves as a living sacrifice, the idea of being transformed, being conformed, all the things we've talked about, is to be Christ on the throne and us at the foot of the throne. And so that is, is what we're talking about here. To worship God, we start by offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. <coughs> Excuse me. To be transformed, to be renewed in our, the way we think, the way we act. In fact, Paul gives more depth to this in the book of Colossians. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul talks about putting on and putting off. Or putting off actually starts with put off and put on. Uh, the idea is to, uh, he says is in verse 5 of chapter 3, put to death therefore what is earthly in you. The things that are earthly in you. In other words, the things that dominate your flesh, which can be everything from sexual desires to gluttony to any kind of, of physical type of thing. He says, Put these things to death. In other words, don't let them own you. And instead, he says, you, I want you to put on. Look at verse 10 of, of, of chapter 3, Colossians. Put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. There we come again to the idea of transformed and renewal of our minds. We're being renewed by the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is, not, there is not Greek or Jew or circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. In other words, this message is for every person to hear. There's no limitation. There's no boundaries. There's no ethnic boundaries. It's, it's to everyone. And then he goes into more detail. Verse 12. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing one another with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you. So you almost all must also forgive. And above all, they put on love. And it says, you know, well, in verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. This idea of, of, of you know, singing hymns and songs and spiritual songs is an act of our worship. We've just done that. But that's not all worship is. Sometimes that's what people limit worship to, is what we sang in church. Uh, hopefully you understand when we, we call this a worship service, not a church service, because we start with the very beginning. We open with, with, with fellowship, that's prayer, uh, worship. Prayer is worship. Reading the Word is worship. Preaching the Word is worship. Sharing in communion is worship. And then he puts this statement so clear, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks, which is an act of worship, to God the Father through Him. In other words, our whole walk is to reflect the fact that we are a person who has given ourselves to Christ as a living sacrifice, as an act of worship. And therefore, we are literally walking in that essence of, of, of being a person who worships God, who wants to see the world through God's eyes. You see someone in need and that becomes an act of, of, of uh, and you respond, that becomes an act of worship. Not just an act of kindness by itself, but you're actually showing God's love. I, I, as I went through this, with all that you do, and those who, of you in here who have taught children will, will think I'm, I'm robbing from a little song here, but I, it, it's what it means. All that you do, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your feet, your hands, 
You know, be careful, little children, what you do, what you, all that that goes with that song. Your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your feet, your thoughts, your attitudes. All that we do is to be submitted to God in the sense of wanting His influence to come through us in all of those things. In the book of Ephesians, in the fifth chapter, Paul's wanting the Ephesians to walk in love. To love God with all your heart, soul, and mind is an act of worship. It's what worship is. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That is an act of worship. And Paul is using those same uh, ideas here uh, in in the sense of of being imitators of God. He said, be imitators of God, verse 1, as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. We are to walk in such a way as that that we we love as Christ loved. And, you know, we get the the, uh, picture in Ephesians also uh, going back just a little, uh, going ahead a little bit, about wives loving your husbands and husbands loving your wives. And it talks about submission on the, on, on the wives' part. And people you know, turn around and say, this is chauvinist today. They, they'll say that's a chauvinist thing. What they miss is verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. First, we submit to one another. Okay? But there is a, a, a picture here. But then ca- the man is called to love his wife as Christ loves the church. I, I, I look at that and, and, we're that we're, and then we're to ultimately have that same love for each other. What it is is that people are supposed to be able to look at our marriage, to look at our family, to look at our congregation and see Christ. Because our lives are to be an act of worship, not just our Sunday mornings. Not just our daily devotionals. We do all heart soul, and mind. I want to look again at the book of Romans. It says, if possible, chapter 12 again, verse 18 here, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. As much as it's up to you. Does that mean that you can make somebody be at peace with you? No, but can you be at peace with somebody who's not at peace with you? Through Christ you can. As much as it's up to you, be at peace. And the idea of being at peace there is to want to seek God's blessing for that person. And so you end up finding yourself praying a blessing over those who will stand against you. You've all heard those multiple scriptures that refer to that thought. But this is what it is to worship God, to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, is to worship God continuously. And so it means, here, what is God, how much at peace is He with me through Jesus Christ? Completely. So my goal is to let that work through me to be at peace in my home, in my work, in the community. I would even go as far as to say in my politics, in my nation, globally. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, that means with everything that you are. The very essence of who you are. He 
he even goes as far as to talk about being submission to authorities. Verse in chapter 13. As much as it is possible, we are to be in submission to the laws of the land. We are to honor those people who are in authority over us. We don't normally consider those things acts of worship, do we? But it's part of who we are to be. And since we've offered ourselves as a living sacrifice, completely and totally, that means, no, we're not worshiping those people. Worship is for God alone. But in the process, as much as possible, be at peace. Now, is it a time and a place where uh, Christians are called to take a stand where they are not peace? Anytime they're asked to violate the Scriptures... But the reality is as much as you can, as much as it's up to you. What do our eyes take in on a regular basis? What, no, and, and I don't think there's any of us in here probably that, that can say that, that our eyes are, are permanently focused on the things of God and, and, and wanting to see everything as God sees it. But what what he's saying here in reference to eyes and ears is be careful what you feed on. And isn't that what Paul just said? Don't don't look at the things the things of the world, but the things of God. And wanting to feed on God is is got to be something that is in our heart on a continuous basis. Somebody asked me once, they said, how are we to, uh, to deal with the Scripture? It says pray continuously, pray without ceasing. We're talking about it right now. If you offered yourself as a living sacrifice to God, and you're in an act of worship with Him, you're in an act of prayer. You're walking in the covering of God. And you become a communion between the two of you. I know for many of you, you've had experiences where you know that you know that you know that God has told you to reach out to somebody or to do a particular thing. And I, and I think to myself, the opportunities that I've had and, and, and the times that I've, I've been able to act on those things, and then I sit back and I wonder how many I have neglected or missed because I was so preoccupied with me. God's not asking the impossible here. If we are being transformed, and by the way, I, I, again, I, I, I give to this picture, it is a growing process. It's a transformation. It's, it's, going, it's happening over a period of time. And it's not going to be perfect on this earth. But, shouldn't we be able to Look at our lives today and compare it to 10, 20, 30. Me, I can go 40, 50. Uh, you know, and, uh, and look at it and say, is there a different person here today than there was 10 years ago? And that, that means for me too in the pulpit as well. Our words are so important. Our words can destroy or they can lift up. In, uh, back in the, in the book of Ephesians here, it says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and submitting to one another with, out of reverence for Christ. Almost all of that deals with our words, worshiping God, interacting with each other. And, and again, this picture, be careful. Uh, you know, it, it, he, he started this, this thought off. Be imitators of God. Walk in love as Christ loved us. Look down to verse 15. 
Look carefully then how you walk. Again, your eyes, your ears, what you're submitting yourself to. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. What was Paul saying there? He says, we live in a, basically the, the context for that is that we live in a fallen world. Evil's happening around us. And evil is anything that does not glorify God. Do you understand that? Sometimes we want evil just to be the, the things that our society might define as wicked or evil. Anything that misses the mark, falls short of the glory of God, falls in the category of evil. And someone will tell me, that's really harsh, Bob. It's really biblical, folks. It's the way it is. So look carefully how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, unwise, if you will, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And verse 18, you've got to understand punctuation wasn't part of the, the original scriptures. The Lord is, and included in this thought, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. What Paul is saying is that do not get drunk with wine. The wine was symbolic in, in, in the context of don't be drunk with the world. But be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The word to be filled here is continuous. I believe with all my heart that at the moment you accept Jesus Christ with your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit indwells you. There's no special ceremony or event to cause that to happen. It happens at the point of confession. But, there is a point where it is also told that we are to invite the Holy Spirit, in, in this context, in on a regular basis. In other words, acknowledge, you are there, Holy Spirit. Guide me, direct me, help me, comfort me, help me to comfort others. Be filled with the Spirit. And as you're being filled with the Spirit, what he says next will be things that will be a natural outflow of someone filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Giving thanks always and for everything. To God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a powerful thought. We come here on Sunday mornings and we do encourage each other with songs and hymns and spiritual songs. I would hope that you allow that to be a practice that invades part of your daily or life outside of church. Where you allow psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to be a part of your Daily life. This picture of do all in the name of the Lord. It's in Colossians, it's in 1 Corinthians 13. It's, it's something that Paul wants us to understand that God has given us to understand what it means to worship. And I want to suggest to you that you're, 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 you're caring for someone. Brad mentioned it earlier this morning, you're giving. And not just you're giving to church, but you're, you're coming alongside someone else and, and assisting them. All this can be and should be an act of worship. As we approach communion this morning, I want to share from the Psalms, a 
an act of worship. This is David writing. It's after he had sinned with Bathsheba. He committed murder in the process. Having Bathsheba's husband put in the front lines knowing that he would be dead before the day was over. David responds to the to the Lord here. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He's acknowledging his sins. He's asking for forgiveness for his sins. He says, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And he says something that some would think peculiar, but it says, against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. What he's acknowledging is that sin first and foremost is an affront to God. Against you only have I sinned, and I have done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words, and you are blameless in your judgment. God, I know that your judgment is, is, is fair and equitable. But I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you for your steadfast love to have a rule of law. Verse 10 of that same chapter, chapter 51 of Psalms, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew the right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. And then he begins the conclusion of this psalm with, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You see what's happening here? He's come before the Lord. He's confident in God's grace and His mercy. We need to come before the Lord with confidence in His grace and His mercy. And He, and, and he says, as a result, I'm, I will open my mouth and declare what you have done for me. I will have a testimony. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise for worship. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I'd give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. In other words, the typical offerings of the Hebrew people. Today, our typical offering is, is our offering box over here. He says, you're not, you're, you're, you don't delight in that sacrifice. You don't, you don't get excited about them. You're not pleased with that offering. Unless, implied here, the sacrifices of God occur in this sense. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice, an act of worship, or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. We worship a God who absolutely loves us. He is alone worthy of our praise and our worship. We use the word glory and praise and other words as well, but all of it is an act of worship. And he's inviting us to come before him, examine our hearts, see our sin, ask for his grace, and then rejoice in his, in his forgiveness.
every time we come to communion, this should be a reflection of our attitude. A broken and contrite, uh, 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 the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In other words, as we come to communion, we are to acknowledge our sin, examine ourselves, and confess our sins, and acknowledge His grace. And it all happened because of what Christ has done for us. It happened at the cross. He gave up His body. He poured out His blood so that we might have eternal life if we confess and believe and acknowledge that He is the Christ, the Son of God. And in doing that, communion is always a good time to offer yourself as a living sacrifice to God for what He has done. Let's have a word of prayer before we sing our communion song and then we'll share in communion. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your word together this last day of the year. We ask, Lord, that you would cause your word to resound in our lives, to touch our hearts, to minister to our spirits, and to cause us to be the children of God you want us to be. We thank you that we can come this morning before communion and acknowledge our sin, examine our hearts, confess our sins, and know that you view us, as you would say in, in Romans 8.1, that we are without sin before your throne. We thank you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Brad, would you lead us and uh, while we are uh, taking communion uh, we'll ask you to come up and pick the communion up for yourselves and uh, hold it until we've all been served and we'll share together let's stand together and it'll make it a little easier for you to walk up here
may be seated. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote this in reference to communion. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's share the bread. goes on. In the same way also Jesus took the cup after supper saying the cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us share. Lord, we know as we share this bread and this cup together, we are to do it, it says, until until you come. To proclaim the Lord's death until you come. That means to us, Lord, that we are to declare what your death has done for us took the the sacrifice of the cross. But we also celebrate because it says until he comes, we celebrate the reality of the resurrection and that you're coming again. We look forward to that day. We join Paul with the words, Maranatha, come soon, Lord Jesus. And say, thank you for your mercy, your love, and your grace. Create a, a, a steadfast heart in us, Lord. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you. As we go into this new year, cause us to do so with the attitude of saying, I love the Lord with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. With everything that I am. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we close? A little bit of time this afternoon. Come join us in the back. We still have plenty of snacks from the Christmas uh, services. So come back and chit-chat a little bit and help us eat some of them. The uh, thing I would like to close with before we... uh Uh-oh. Bob shuffled a page of me. Uh, Before we sing the doxology... 2 Thessalonians 3.16 says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. And I'll offer that to you as a closing today. God be with you all. Let's sing together. This is uh, a cappella, so join in. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless you. Have a good week.